Hello and welcome to this session of the Equality Bahamas CEDAW Convention Speaker Series, where we will be looking at Article 10, which really zeroes in on education. We are really excited to be continuing this series, which we started last year, around mid-year, to ensure that people get a better understanding of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which we know as CEDAW, and we refer to as the Bill of Women's Rights. The Bahamas is coming up on its 30th anniversary of the ratification of the convention. We ratified in October of 1993. So this year in October, we'll be celebrating that 30 year mark. And as we lead up to it, we'll be looking at one article at a time, um, mostly on a monthly basis so that we can delve in a little bit deeper and get a better understanding of how each article applies across the board, but also very specifically to the Bahamas. And we can have a look at the concluding observations from 2018, which was the last time that the Bahamas went before the CEDAW committee and got some really solid recommendations in various different areas, including education. Um, please use the chat. You can feel free to type comments and questions if you're watching on Facebook, and we'll be sure to look for those and be able to pose those questions. So we're starting off with a presentation that will be about 30 minutes of our time, and then we should have about 30 minutes left for us to have an open discussion and be able to ask questions, raise challenges, share ideas, really around how we can better use CEDAW, how we can really look at Article 10 and improve the Bahamas' compliance with the convention. I'm now turning over to Marion Bethel, who is an attorney in the Bahamas and also a Bahamian member of the CEDAW committee. And of course she knows the committee members very well and she will bring an introduction to our speaker today. Okay, well, good morning to, to all of us and good afternoon to our guest speaker and to other persons around the world who are in different time zones. It's really great to be here. It feels as though we haven't had a session uh, for a long time, but I think it was just December that, that we had Article 9 with um, Aruna Narain. And so here we are again today. And before I introduce our guest speaker, I just want to again, just say how um, honored I am to be a part of Equality Bahamas. And I'm a, a, at least one or two generations above, you know, beyond the, the Equality Bahamas um, general membership, Alicia, Lauren, you all are doing a phenomenal job in the Bahamas, just, um, you know, helping us to anchor seed off for one, but beyond that, you do your own work in Equality Bahamas. Um, around uh, gender equality, equality for the LGBTQIA um, constituents in the Bahamas. I'm just really um, amazed at the, the quality of the work that you do and how you, and how you do it, the processes that Equality Bahamas uses to really educate and bring awareness to um, the Bahamas and the region in regard to gender equality. So I can't say enough how proud I am to be affiliated with you and to, and that you've taken on this work of CEDAW too. Thank you so much. And in particular, Alicia and Lauren and all the executive team of Equality Bahamas. Um, yeah, it's good, good, great work. And so that brings us to, to um, our session today. And I wanna welcome with all my heart, Hilary Bedema from Ghana, who is here with us uh, this morning, this afternoon. Um, to um, elaborate on Article 10 of the convention in which she has um, profound expertise. This is the general recommendation um, of the CEDAW committee that, that Hillary anchored and, uh, and spearheaded and led along with Barbara Bailey of Jamaica. And so this is her area, one of her areas of expertise um, in the CEDAW committee. So we are really, um, uh, it's great to have her here to do this. And so I first met Hillary in 2017 when I joined the CEDAW committee and she was my senior at that time and um, just helped me through a lot of the challenges and, and the highs that, that we experience on the committee. Um, Hillary has brought her tremendous uh, legal and professional skills and talents to the CEDAW committee. And um, in any issue that, that, that we're confronted with, Hillary is um, concise, incisive, insightful, creative. I particularly admire that she is so skilled um, with, in, in the legal area 
and also brings a tremendous amount of creativity to the committee in terms of just solving issues and, and bringing results that are both you know sharp and creative and I think that creative part along with the legal talent is something that I just find very very attractive and and useful in the committee because it's not always just a black and white situation but Hillary finds the the nuances and um and clarifies them for us as a committee and so I have really benefited from from her skills and talents I was on a committee um a working group on inquiries which is part of the optional protocol which um Hillary headed and um just laid a, a very solid foundation for that uh, working group and, and the processes under the optional protocol under the inquiry. So that's another area that I've benefited from being very close to Hillary with. And then of course, in 2019, Hillary became chair of the CEDAW committee and led us through two years of, of, of stellar leadership and um, I think almost two sessions of COVID, right, Hillary? Yes, we, where we were in 2020, we were confronted with, with COVID, all of us, and we had to do sessions online. Hillary, um, even pre-COVID, gave stellar leadership, and certainly during those um, two sessions of, of, um, of the COVID crisis. And so I just have absorbed a lot, Hillary, from, from your performances and, and, and your inputs at, at the, on the CEDAW committee and um, in these last two years that I'm going to be a part of I'm I'm going to just continue to to be with you in, in ways that are productive and so um, I just want to then move into uh, Hilary Bedema is a lawyer, training specialist, human rights and gender equality activist in Ghana, and a gender consultant whose 44-year career in law has been in private legal practice, lecturing, legislative advocacy, policy development, economic empowerment, curriculum development, and mentoring. She is the rector of the Law Institute, Ghana's premier vocational legal training uh, facility, which provides training in paralegal studies, corporate governance, entrepreneurship, human rights law, and capacity building for a wide range of organizations. She's also a senior adjunct fellow at Ghana's Institute of Economic Affairs. Her experience spans the international and national levels. In 2019, she was recognized by a political's gender equality as one of the world's top 100 most influential people in global policy. In June 2022, she received the Institute for African Women in Law's Excellence in Law and Leadership Award as a women's rights activist in international law. Hillary is the former chair of the UN Committee on the Convention, the CEDAW Convention, and she has extensive experience in all of its thematic areas and has held several positions on the committee, including the Working Group on Inquiries, of which I've spoken, and she is now currently chair of the Working Group on Communications, which is the individual communications that we receive from women around the world. Hillary holds an LLM from Georgetown University. Hillary, my friend, my dear friend, I warmly welcome you to this session with Equality Bahamas. And thank you so, so very much for being here with us. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Marian. Uh, thank you for these very kind words. At times you wonder whether it's you being spoken about, but you. You have a way of bringing the best out in everyone. And it has stood us in very good stead in our friend spirit. And indeed, we have uh, collaborated very well in various areas. I want to now take the opportunity to thank Equality uh, Bahamas for this initiative, very, very innovative, and marking your 30th year of, um, of the convention and the 40th year for uh, CEDAW. This is a really opportune time. And uh, this innovation is something we all envy. Very well done. Let me begin by uh, saying that education has always been my passion. Let me, let, 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 let me begin by clarifying uh, where I uh, stand, uh, making full disclosure as it were. I am the daughter of a school headmistress, the granddaughter 
of a school headmaster. And uh, education was just it. We lived with education. And school was exciting. It was magic. So it is not a surprise that I find myself doing so much training and having a passion for this, um, this area. At that time, it was so clear education was a game changer. There was nothing you could do without education and you kind of imbibed it right from the household level. My grandmother would reprimand you if you opened a can of milk. We, we had milk in cans, we still do, upside down. She would ask you whether that was the mark of an educated woman. And I brought the can of milk here, you had to open it the right way around. My grandfather, the, who was a catechist and a teacher, commanded such respect. So it was obvious that from a simple domestic task in a small kitchen to public cloud, education was the way. And I hope that we can continue in this trend. As a result of this, increase the value that we have for education and use it as a game changer. I will begin my presentation by looking at the convention. I know that it's probably been broached before, but we can do a little bit just as a recap, because in the course of my presentation, I will be using the convention, our concluding observations and general recommendation 36 to ground whatever it is that the Bahamas has to do. Then the presentation will be framed within the context of rights to education, rights within education and rights through education. There are so many frameworks, but I think that this is probably the neatest that we can do in this space of time for the task ahead of us. So um, I will begin by looking uh, an, an in overview of the convention. As we probably know, it has 16 thematic articles and articles one and two deal with discrimination. There's direct and indirect discrimination. Direct is when uh, the a law says clearly that girls, for example, cannot go to school. Thankfully, now um, this is rare. And uh, for basic education, no. Though for higher education, we have all seen the demarche uh, going backwards, regression in, in, in girls' education. Indirect would be where everyone is allowed to go to school, but the context in the school, the environment, is such that it disadvantages girls. And we'll be seeing part of that today. There's also the um, cumulative or continuing discrimination. And this is where poor quality basic and high school education or disproportionate levels of poverty, sometimes in rural areas, result in a lack of access to higher education. So one can start education, but one will not progress properly through this cumulative discrimination. In Africa, we have a 2003 communication by a, a group of um, individuals in Southern Cameroon against the Republic of Cameroon. Under, this came under the African Charter, which illustrates this. They allege that Cameroon had discriminated against Southern Cameroon by violating Article 17 of the African Charter that guarantees every individual a right to education. And they had done this through what the respondents called a monopolistic control of the Ministry of Education, under funding of private, uh, primary education, failure to build new schools and closing of teacher training colleges, and then uh, discrimination in admission into the polytechnic. Even though the commission did not find a violation, their argument illustrates how a marginalization in the form of underfunding primary education and closing schools or not having the right atmosphere at the beginning can lead to high levels of illiteracy, lack of access to higher education, and which is cumulative or continuing discrimination. Now, we find uh, uh, it resonates in the concluding graph 33A, the committee talked about sufficient, insufficient measures taken to ensure access to high quality education for all girls, in particular, 
those in the family islands and those from disadvantaged communities, including girls of Haitian descent, and ask them to improve the quality of education, in particular in public schools. So we, we have the same thing about uh, primary education, or, uh, education not being of the best quality. So the recommendation was equal access to high quality education at primary and secondary levels. We also have single or intersectional or multiple discrimination. And this is where in our general recommendation 28, we have the forms of intersection, intersecting discrimination, for example, race, ethnicity, religion, belief, all coming in. Hardly ever is a woman discriminated on one ground. And if uh, there's gender, there is something usually that goes with uh, gender. Again, in the area of um, intersecting discrimination, it is an area that impacts admissions to schools. And so this is an area that we should look at very closely. Here again, we have a case, the case of Yin and Bosico children in the Dominican Republic, where the intersecting discrimination was called in-country inequality. And it came in the form of migrant status, that is the children of Asian descent, who lacked birth certificates. And this intersected with the sex, they were girls, to exclude them from assessing education in the Dominican Republic. So in this case, the Inter-American Court ruled in their favor. So we see examples of discrimination reflected in education. Now, the core obligations of states, so we, we are looking first, the first part has looked at discrimination. The core obligation of states, which is in Article 2, and um, reflected in general recommendation 28 again, gives the duty to states to, ident it identifies the general obligations of states parties. And they are to respect, that is to refrain from laws and policies that directly interfere or indirectly with women's enjoyment of the rights. So first respect, they are to protect, that is to make sure that there is no discrimination by state or non-state actors as far as girls education is concerned or in all forms in all forms of rights but we are looking at education and girls education now and they are to fulfill and to promote that means they must take positive steps to ensure that there's equality between men and women forward looking and um, raising awareness on women's rights so article 2 as you are aware a is what barbados has a reservation to. And even though there are ways of going about ingenious legal ways of going around this reservation, I find it problematic for two reasons. Number one, not everybody will have that acumen or skill. Number two, for the optics, for the political will, for the declaration, it is counterproductive to have a, a, a reservation against an article that promotes equality and non-discrimination. So the optics must be right. And what is the uh, corrective approach? It is that of substantive equality. That is equality of outcomes. At the end of the day, the outcomes must be the same. They must be good. They must be human rights compliant, and they must advance women's educational rights as we'll see later. So substantive equality in the area of education, it should interrogate the teacher's teaching content. First of all, what do you teach? Methodology, how do you teach it? And classroom practices, what do you say? What do you exhibit to see that they promote the qualities of outcomes for girls as well as boys? My research around the world shows, not around the world really, in, in various places, outside and within Ghana, shows that sometimes utterances that teachers make about girls and they are stereotyped utterances, are a dis disincentive and therefore could be a bar to substantive equality. Today, we move beyond substantive equality. We talk about transformative equality and that connects equal rights to social rights, like education. It challenges the prevailing uh, gender ideology and it demands a realignment of power and resources between men and women. 
So if it is necessary to put more resources into girls' education to have the outcome you want, yes, transformational equality. And it looks at male-oriented institutions and education is one of them and social structures that need transformation. So already it links with article three that deals with the institutions. So now article three deals with institutional arrangements and it positions CEDAW as a developmental instrument and grounds its synergies with the SDGs. Article four, the temporary special measures. Article five, stereotypes, six, trafficking, seven and eight, participation in, in public and international life, nine, nationality, 10, education, 11, employment, 12, health, 13, access to social economic benefits, 14 is critical. Because even though it talks about rural women, this is where we deal with the list of disadvantaged groups of women that you see before you. And they are, they are the women for whom we have intersecting discrimination. And uh, 15 is equality before the law, access to justice, and 16 is family life. The interesting thing about all these articles is that they have implications in education. And as we move along, I'm sure that these will be apparent. Now let's move to contextualize education. Education is a human right and it is, education is a human right in itself and it is an indispensable means of realizing other human rights. Now article 10 is the only article that mentions girls. And when you look at Article 10, it covers the elimination of discrimination uh, in education. And this is where uh, the issue of the uh, reservation is um, troubling. The same conditions for career and vocational guidance. It talks about the same curriculum, staff teaching examinations. So here we should be aware that there should be no canalization. In some schools, we still have girls trotting off to do uh, cookery and needlework and boys doing woodwork and things like that. No, uh, Article 10 does not permit this. It talks about the elimination of stereotypes. And for that reason, it encourages co-education and uh, other types of education that will achieve this. Because we do recognize that in some countries, some jurisdictions, co-education cannot happen. But when this is the uh, case, there must be the same opportunities to benefit from all uh, that the other side is benefiting from including scholarships. Then there must be programs for continuing education to reduce gaps for women, uh, girls, reduction of female dropout rates, same opportunities in sports. This did not come up during your, um, your dialogue or your concluding observations, but it is a tremendously important uh, part uh, because sports breaks many barriers and has immense advantages for education. And, uh, there must be access to specific educational information to secure the health and well being of families. And this is the only um, article in education that has found expression in our optional protocol. This is where complaints are brought about violations of the convention. This was a complaint brought in respect of health, but the, uh, the author of the communication, the one who brought the communication said this article had been violated because nobody informed her about the risks of the uh, procedure that she went through. So um, forgive me for going through a long quotation which I would have produced because it is one of my favorites where education is concerned. It says that it is a human right. It serves as a gateway that allows individuals to access and enjoy other human rights. Education broadens the perspectives of a girl about the role she can play. It provides a key space and often it is the only space for meeting peers, mentors and role models and opens new spaces for an empowered girl to act in, reach out and influence others. Unique to education, and this is what I love, is the fact that once you have gained it, it cannot be taken away. Other rights can be taken away. Once you have gained education, what you have gained is yours and yours forever. It is therefore a gatekeeper right. And our 
the rapporteur of the special, uh, the report of the special rapporteur on the right to education says it is, should be driven by a rights-based approach. That means um, that is essential for ending multiple forms of discrimination for, from which women and girls suffer. And this means that educating women and girls should, as a matter of priority, be viewed as a human rights imperative rather than being undertaken solely because of the potential benefits to uh, their children or to society. Very often when we are talking about the right to education, and I do that all the time, we talk about the developmental advantages, the drop in fertility, maternal mortality, promoting health and nutrition, protecting against the early and child marriages, opportunity for furthering education, decent employment, breaking the cycle of intergenerational poverty, reducing the vulnerability to uh, violence. Lofty aims. But the special uh, rapporteur says, this notwithstanding, we should situate and state education as a human right. And there are four aspects of education that uh, must be fulfilled. This is in the CISC general comment 13, and also in our general recommendation 36, that it must be available, accessible, adaptable, and acceptable. Now, having said all this, one would have thought, one, my work was done, and two, I would be living in a, a very beautiful world in which the work is cut out for me. But no, when you look at the next slide, you will see the value or lack of value that we seem to attach to education. First, if you look at our follow-up items, that is after we've had a dialogue with the state, we give them four paragraphs on which to work on and to report by the next, within the next two years. From 2008 to 2016, education did not feature. From 2016 to 2019, whereas violence against women had 36% of the follow-ups, all the figures are there, I'm not going to read through them. Education accounts for a measly 3.3 of the follow-ups. That means we don't often tell states to follow up in education. And it would probably mean that we are not getting enough emphasis from the states about what the lack of education is doing to the human rights. So it comes down low on the totem pole. But this is the snapshot, and this is what um, is a bit distressing. Now, we move on and look at the framing. As I said, Reframing my uh, presentation and write through education, we associate them with parity and physical access. When we see the, uh, do a head count and we see the girls are in the classroom, the same as the boys, we think we are done. No. Our statement on the SDG says that numerical parity is an important goal, but doesn't translate into substantive equality, right to education. This requires, if we want substantive equality, equality of outcomes, there must be the fundamental transformation of economic and social institutions, including the educational institution itself, and the beliefs and norms and attitudes that shape them at every stage of uh, the society, from households to labor markets, from communities, local, global, uh, and governance institutions. So instead of just simply absorbing more girls into fragile and underfunded educational systems, schools must provide a safe learning environment for girls and boys and quality education that promotes equality through a progressive curriculum. And how does this affect uh, the Bahamas? We have our concluding observations, paragraph 33a, that talks about insufficient measures to ensure high quality education. And it asks, as we've said again, we've seen again, that everyone must be included, high quality education. Now let's move to rights within education. What do 
we mean when we talk about rights within education? CEDAW in our general recommendation says the rights within education addresses the psychological and cognitive, cognitive conditions within education and the barriers to girls' education. So it's not enough just to have them in the classroom. What is going on there? What is going on in their minds? And what are some of the issues? Because this evaluates how the school environment advances or limits girls' access to education. What are some of the issues that have come up and do come up even though if we don't, they're not always in the room? We know the teacher training curriculum. And our recommendation has been mandatory gender studies, which should cover human rights, gender sensitivity, and target ways in which gender stereotypes that are reproduced through uh, various aspects of schooling are stemmed. The pedagogy should involve a teaching and learning environment where inequality resulting from uh, intersectionality are understood, explained, and challenged. We, the expected outcome should be a change in the teacher attitude and behavior. But when we look at this recommendation and talk about teacher training, we must also be mindful about the overpopulation of women in teacher training, especially at the lower levels, and the stereotypes it, it sends that, for example, nursery education is a women's core. We also talk about a lack of incentives for female teachers in, in role models, especially in the rural areas. Here we are talking about family islands. Uh, it's far. We need to incentivize the teachers who go there so that they can become role models to the girls there that they can aspire to. For many of us who have grown up in the uh, third world, we will never underestimate the uh, effect of our teachers, even the way they walked and carry the umbrella in the hot sun was an incentive for you to do that. There's an issue of the textbooks and gendered allocation of tasks in school. Sometimes within the school, the work the boys are asked to do outside of academics and girls are different. And this sends a message. We also talk about subject choice as a vector for intelligence and indirect discrimination. We already know we talk about more and more girls needed in the STEM area and they, that they pursue the traditionally oriented fields and that is a negative stereotype and a, a, a structural a barrier. But also my research has also shown that this subject choice is a proxy for depicting girls as unintelligent because they're doing home science, they're not doing uh, chemistry and biology and comments are made about them. So uh, more girls in STEM, what is the way out? They must receive counseling we must have temporary special measures, especially in the Bahamas, to include girls in the blue economy. Girls must be counseled to do meteorological uh, studies, fisheries, marine sciences, and so on. No longer business as usual, climate change. What is happening here? This is what girls should be doing. And in our um, concluding observations to St. Kitts and the Navis, we talked about it and said we should strengthen measures to eliminate discriminatory gender stereotypes. And these very subjects I've talked about, as well as the uh, digital field should be, uh, the blue economy should be marked. And for that caveat, where sciences are used to uh, denigrate girls, one of our concluding observations says, while we want girls to do science, engineering, and maths, it should not be at the expense of the arts and social sciences. There's also the issue of inclusive education. And here we have the issues of disability. Uh, we have um, made concluding observations for uh, assistive devices, uh, accessibility to combat stereotypes of persons with girls with disability because they, they undergo more, more stress and more discrimination than boys, reasonable accommodation, and infusing a gender and disability perspective into girls' education. Then one, another aspect is pregnancy-related uh, discrimination, which is exclusion. And again, the placement in uh, concluding observations to the Bahamas, it says uh, it's either providing access to continued education foundation, put an unquote to avoid stigmatization. Uh, and practical measures to ensure their re-entry and retention in schools. No, uh, the committee 
does not want this going to special schools because in a way it is a punitive or a pseudo punitive measure which um, uh, ensures that uh, it's kind of punishing girls for being pregnant and where there are time limits like stay away for six months or one year these also are equally uh, discriminatory uh, uh, comprehensive sexuality education which should uh, come into place because because of its absence there is an increase in violence against girls especially um, sexual violence and the reason is why uh, there is this um, this resistance is that um, parents and what we see is that it's poorly taught it's uh, sometimes farmed out to third parties and uh, what we ask for are uh, integral curriculum, innovative, progressive, age appropriate, on, focused on power, reproductive health, and uh, to prevent early and teenage uh, uh, pregnancy. And this is because there's resistance by parents, by community people, by stakeholders to uh, compose, uh, comprehensive sexuality education. We also have issues of violence and sexual harassment and bullying, but this did not come out in uh, the, the dialogue. And I want to flag that it is a big issue and that it should be kept on front burner. Now, the third part is the rights through education and rights through education are there to ensure that educational achievements lead to decent employment. The currency of the certificate that girls get should be uh, worth something in the market. And this is compromised when girls' educational achievements don't translate into their participation in higher education, leadership, decision-making, legislative bodies, correlative employment and income, notwithstanding that they achieve better than boys in school. And we are concerned about this due to patriarchal attitudes, the male breadwinner model, cultural norms, the educational system itself is structured in such a way that it does not do justice to this. I know I'm talking a little much. I intend to end in the next three, five minutes, but let me give this graphic example that in one country, the courses that women do, girls do, need higher education to be able to get traction. So before you can become a teacher, you need a master's degree. And the majority of people who become teachers are women. For the, uh, the subjects that earn a lot of money, the technical areas and so on, uh, they don't need that much education. So here it is the educational system itself that is ensuring that girls have a longer education, higher qualifications, and yet when they come out, they're less paid. Now let's look at the next uh, graph, at the next uh, slide, which is a graph of a country. Look at the performance. This is a feminist, educationist paradise. Look at how well the girls are doing in law, education, uh, uh, medicine, pharmacy, are Greek. They are head and shoulders ahead of the boys. The boys are not even there because in um, medicine, for example, let's take medicine. We need some of these graphic, uh, uh, let's take pharmacy, for example, for the year 2017 to 2018, 345 girls and 87 boys. Do the tally at the end. The boys are not in school. Where are the boys? Usually we are happy when girls are doing well. And um, we say, um, yeah, we, we're happy when they're doing well. But here it's concerning because the low level of boys rings alarm bells. Now for this country, look at our recommendations in the next paragraph. Education, we note with concern the low number of boys enrolled in formal education when compared with girls. And boys are forced to work because of the economic crisis. Uh, and they allegedly, in this case, follow their fathers into business and politics, the areas that matter. And this impacts the situation on the value accorded to girls' education and employment prospects. With girls doing so well, you would think they would have no problem in employment. 
look at what we said about uh, employment. Eliminate horizontal and vertical occupational segregation. Encourage them to select non-traditional career paths. Now, this is not education. They've done it in education. We are now asking them to do it in the career paths and to break the glass ceiling. Doesn't that sound oxymoronic? But this is the situation. And the same we see in the Caribbean. And I thank you because this phenomenon, for us, it's everywhere. It was first intellectually flagged in the Caribbean. And I thank my colleague also, Rhoda Redock, for the deep discussions we've had in this area. Now, the last but one slide. This is what our general recommendation 36 says, that this is the overview. And I'd like you to look at it because it covers almost all the bases in education. And uh, with this, I would want to say that education is the fundamental right, it's the basic right. It's the, the, the foundation on which all others are built. And we should endeavor to make sure that these shortfalls we've noticed in the presentation, in our concluding observations are addressed. Uh, also in the committee, I am known as the one who will not miss up an opportunity to take an African. I thank you all for being here. And in thanking you, the African proverb is that, you see, when elders come together in the evening, in the moonlight, to discuss matters of concern in the compound of one of them, it isn't because the, the moon isn't shining brightly in the compound of the other. It is because of communication, collaboration, and moving a community forward. I thank you for leaving the moonlight in your compound and coming here that in the interest of our moving together as a community, we discuss these issues in this moonlight. I thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. I, that was such a rich presentation. And I think you really helped to broaden the way that we look at education with regard to women and girls. Because I think we often think about just getting, getting girls in classrooms and ensuring that they get an education, but not really thinking about some of the more systemic issues. So right up at the top, I was really interested in what you were saying about um, equality of outcomes and the importance of paying attention to what is taught, how it's taught, and some of the things that teachers might say. And I connected that to what you said later on about um, what teacher training looks like and ensuring that gender equality, women's rights are a part of that training. What do you think that that looks like um, in really practical terms? You know, is this something that's happening when you're studying for your, your degree in education or is this sort of the annual training that teachers are going through? And what does that training look like? Uh, currently, it is not as widespread as we would want to. And we have recommended, these are the recommendations that is infused into the teacher training curriculum. Uh, for my country, for example, in the past three years, this has is taking place. But how examinable it is, how it is looked at when uh, teaching practice is being examined, how it is looked at in some of the practices in our schools is, is still evolving. For example, in our, in our environment, especially in the public schools, each day or maybe twice a week, uh, the children, stand outside at assembly. And the girls are put in front and the boys are put at the back, regardless of height. And in a research that was done, the girls said it gave them the impression that the boys were overseeing them and that the tallest girl is less important than the shortest boy. So we need to look at practices like this as well. Not only the, the, the hard stuff in the textbook and the theories, but also how these little practices also uh, change the dynamics in the classroom. Now, I have recommended that for all those teachers who have not gone through this uh, system, and they are still teaching children, they do the uh, continuing education. It's better to do a one-off once a year than nothing at all. Because even there was a time I had about a three hour engagement with teachers and they said it made a great deal of difference. And so we've got to tackle the matter from both ends, from those who are in it already 
uh, who are going in and for, for those who are already out. So this would be a long answer to a very short question. Thank you for that. Um, for those who are joining us in Zoom, if you have questions, feel free to just use the raise your hand function so we know to come to you and you can unmute and ask your question or make your comment. You can do the same in the chat. For those on Facebook, you can tap, type into the comments and we'll look for your, your contributions and share them here. Um, anybody have any questions here? If not, I can keep going because I have quite a list. <laughs> <laughs> I was really interested in what you said about putting more resources into girls education being okay because what we're looking for is an equality of outcome and I think that was such an important point to make because when we're talking about women's rights in general when we're talking about girls a lot of the comments from the public are about girls really doing well succeeding in school getting the highest grades being the ones that get higher education why are we putting all of our resources into girls the boys are being left behind not really getting the understanding that equality isn't about what we put into it but what we're trying to get out of it right how do, how do we make that more clear for people and what does that look like in practice when it comes to education this place this space that's very hotly contested because people feel very strongly that boys are being intentionally left behind. Very good. Uh, first and foremost, I think it is an understanding of what the actual picture is. I get asked that all the time, that the girls are doing very well. And I point out to them, where are the girls doing well? That's question number one. In the traditional female feminine field. Eve, then, question number two, when even the girls enter the male dominated spaces, which ones do they enter? We still have a deficit of girls in engineering, even though we may have them in medicine. And sometimes when girls enter predominantly male fields, the value of those fields drops. When we have a lot of female doctors, the remuneration, even the respect accorded medicine is not the same. We need to address that. That is uh, the second point. The third point is the one that I have so graphically shown in that chart. What is it that accounts for such performance in school and then nothing showing when they get to work? That trajectory. We still come back to the patriarchal issues, the uh, issue of um, the male breadwinner. So if there's any tension, it's the women who stay at home and you saw it during the COVID. So it is a matter of number one, looking at the gaps in the educational uh, institutions or in the educational trajectory, looking at where they claim the boys are being left behind, because indeed, when they leave school in many jurisdictions, they go into business, they go into um, politics, they go into areas that make money or have influence. Regrettably, also, sometimes they go into gangs and things like that. But these are the areas that we should address. And it is not because the resources are not put in, but it is this same um, patriarchy and definitions of masculinity that give that picture, yes, or that produce that result. Because when we're talking about dismantling the institution, we're talking about education as well. It's male dominated. Go to the top, go to the universities, uh, go uh, professors, how many are females? And then compare that to what they did in school. So it cannot be that men are being left behind. It is the defining of their spaces and what we and they have interpreted masculinity to be, that is part of the problem. Definitely. Um, you also talked about this way of looking at girls' education as linked to developmental goals rather than as inherent human rights. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what you mean by that? Thank you very much. 
when we are making the case for girls' education, we sometimes, many times, focus on the developmental dividends as paramount. We look at the indicators that I have uh, mentioned that uh, uh, drop in fertility, maternal mortality, and so on. And these are excellent reasons. But to focus on those reasons without grounding them in rights takes away from the right-based approach to education. It, it seems to say that if maternal mortality will drop, if all those things will happen, then there is no right to education. If there was a way we could get them to work, there would be no right to education. So if the state could find a way of keeping girls out of school and getting these things done, it would be justified if we use this argument. But when we talk about education as an inherent right, it means that yes, we get these dividends, but girls must go to school for that value of going to school. That which I talk about that can never be taken away from them. That confidence, that which was built into my D DNA by seeing two previous successions of educated people and knowing that education gave me something right, something more than just the ability to, well, it's not just then the ability to drop uh, maternal mortality. It gives, that, it gives that confidence to operate in public spaces as well. The, the totality of the right. So if we, if we focus on the de developmental dividend, we will see, and it's happening in some parts of the world. We can deal with maternal mortality. We can deal with uh, improved nutrition and health. We have the money, stay at home. And that's not what we want. And I am not saying this because I love saying this. This is what is in our jurisprudence. So it's not me making propaganda. This is the special rapporteur on education. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. <laughs> I see that Marion has a, a question or a comment. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Alicia. And thank you so much, Hillary, for a very, very comprehensive um, elaboration of Article 10 and the, your responses so far. Um, I'd like to just look a little bit at this issue of comprehensive sexuality education, which we on the committee and which our, um, our GR 36 talks about, et cetera. And when countries come before us, we often uh, talk about comprehensive sexuality education um, for our primary and high school students and moving forward and how this impacts the total life cycle of women and girls and what it means and how... Um, uh, effective it can be if the school curriculum actually incorporates this. And if I look at the Bahamas, for example, there's a strong resistance to actually doing anything about comprehensive sexuality education, which has um, huge implications for, for our young women and girls who um, become pregnant in, um, in high school and their return to high school and their whole education may be impeded because of, of, of pregnancy. And so I'm really trying to ask what, in your view, would this look like and how can we, comprehensive sexuality education and concretely, and how can we get um, states, parties and ministries of education to actually move on this? And how can we also mobilize our, our community, churches, our you know, parents to really understand how this can work and how it can be effective and how it can actually make a difference to, to the lives of women and girls and our communities and, and development and has huge implications. And so what are your thoughts on that and, and how can be actually um, uh, delivered on as a, as a recommendation that we often make? And I know it depends on different countries, but you can talk about that too. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, um, it shouldn't be this way. We shouldn't be going about it this way, but this is one of the effective ways of going about it, is to look at the data. Because as far as I'm concerned, this is part of education. 
the education about girls' bodies, what happens to them, and how this um, impacts them, positively or negatively, should be mainstream education. But because of the issues of morality and so on, taboo attached to it, it doesn't work this way. So let's look at the data. Let's look at the girls who get pregnant. Let's look at what they're not completing their education does to them. And then this can be the starting point. And from there, we go to the curriculum because, because of the moral baggage attached to this. Once you moot it, there are constituencies who resist it without even knowing what is in there. Let us engage them in drawing the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Let us tell them what the children should know at every age. Let us not only look at the data on a dropouts, but on the sexual assault data mm -hmm. from our police service. Mm -hmm. How the girls who get raped and so on. If they had this knowledge, because some of them even do not know what's happening until it has happened, wouldn't they be better situated to protect themselves? So let's look at the, uh, let's look at the curriculum. We may not get everything in one shot, but we will certainly get better than the biology that is being taught in the name of comprehensive sexuality education. And thirdly, let, them, let us um, be frank that the age of innocence is sadly gone. Uh, the things that the children watch behind our backs on, the, on social media and so on and so forth, the misinformation has to be correct. And so let's work together with community, with churches to, to, to correct. I myself have worked with a church in Sunday school in my own country. And it was to protect the even four year olds who get uh, uh, defiled. Uh, it changed a bit. But let me say that I, I do see the point resistance is there even today, even in my country. But it is about breaking it down looking at the statistics, looking at what this education can do, uh, treading cautiously as to what they think is controversial and how we will, we will put those in because they have to be put in, but we have to put in and uh, the fears of the very powerful uh, constituencies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you very much for that. Hilary. I, I think you've really pointed out some um, uh, areas that, that, that we can use. And even as an NGO, which I, you know, in terms of Equality Bahamas, perhaps advocating for this kind of, of, of comprehensive sexuality education can use. And I think the, the data driven aspect of it is just critical. And, 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 and that, was, that was your lead in, in terms of, of young girls who are pregnant, the young men who um um, are with them in, in this, what, what does that look like? Um, how does this relate to gender-based violence, et cetera? I, I think these are all critical things that, that, that you've brought about. And then um, you know, re re liaising with our, with our churches, which, which um, may have moral positions on this, and our parents and other um, stakeholders in our community, and really trying to um, convince them with the data and the and the and the, and the qualitative narratives that we have um, about the the impact and the effectiveness of, of um, and efforts in, in trying to make this happen so that we can can um, address the address the issue and I and I think that is really I think you've given us a lot to think about and how we can um, move forward in this community on in that area. Thank you. Yeah, I also appreciate that you challenge us to come up with some specifics because a lot of times we do have that happen where we are suggesting that certain things have to happen. We're demanding things of the state 
and it might respond in the most minor and ineffective ways, but we can actually make really solid, comprehensive recommendations. Like we could put forward a curriculum, right? If we have the, the resources to do it, that's another story. Uh, but sometimes it really helps to be very specific about what we're demanding. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Does anyone here on Zoom have any questions or, or comments? I can give you some more time to think about it because I also wanted to ask you, Hillary, about, you mentioned the, the sort of special schools that girls get sent to um, for a number of months, maybe for a school year, and it's effectively a suspension, right, from their, their regular school and they're sort of put away. And the excuse is that it's to spare them from stigma. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in the Bahamas, we also have the case of other students being sent to different schools, like students with disabilities. Does the CDOT, does CDOT have the same position on students with disabilities that they should be in um, regular schools and that schools should be making accommodations for students with different needs? Absolutely. Uh, CDOT says inclusive education is a right. Uh, I alluded to it briefly towards the end of the presentation. And that reasonable accommodation, the assistive devices, the um, closed captioning, the uh, structures, infrastructure should accommodate, um, should accommodate everyone, inclusive education. And this is why I dealt with a pregnancy under exclusion uh, together with um, disability. Yes, um, it's all part of inclusive education. Uh, the children with disability must be in mainstream school. Unless the disability is so, you know, so uh, strong. And even though, even then, as much as they can uh, attend the mainstream, they can, they should, and then have this other extra uh, uh, component. So that is for uh, uh, the children with disability, especially girls, because uh, what we found out is that they are kept out of school in some cases at twice the rate of men, of boys. They are uh, stigmatized, they are teased more, they are more subject to uh, sexual abuse. So this is for uh, uh, the girls with the disability. So in the same token, as uh, I said, the putting the girls in a different school, or schooling in different hours, or sometimes even they're made to change the courses. They are doing a particular course when they become pregnant, they want to go back to school. They have to do a different kind of course, which uh, in many instances is not regarded as prestigious as the one they were pulled out of. So, um, it, it is a suspension. The, our recommendations say that with all the support that we, 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 we recommend, we should avoid making teen pregnancy look like a norm. Uh, so that should be part of the education. And if there's sexuality education, if there's empowering education, girls will be able to handle these issues better. We will not see them at the same rate. And so there is a link between the two. I remember I once gave a talk like this and somebody put the hand up and said, well, what I was advocating, they, he didn't agree because in his country, all the girls are getting pregnant in school and the school looks like a maternity clinic. And I said, yes, it's because there's no se comprehensive sexuality education. That's where you should look. The African proverb says, look at where you slipped, not where you fell. That's where you should look and correct that part. If it is taught well, you will not have a school that looks like a maternity clinic. And when I probed him further on the, what they had for um, comprehensive sexuality education, there was, there was nothing really, there was nothing. Girls who go to school must have this education and they must have a vision incorporated in the uh, education, the rights within education that we talk about that will spur them on to attain the equality of outcomes that we're talking about. And again, all this is in our jurisprudence. 
And you mentioned a few times general recommendation 36 on education. And we've talked about general recommendations a little bit in previous sessions, but could you tell us why this general recommendation was, was drafted, why this was important? Um, since we already have Article 10, why did we need GR 36? Thank you. Uh, we craft general recommendations as part of our soft law to fill in the gaps that are in the main law, uh, main, main text. Number two, to deal with issues that recur. For example, we do not have issues of ICT, uh, I don't think, in Article 10. And so for these reasons, as this is a living document and it is involving, we see gaps, we see a new phenomenon, we see new forms of violence uh, or new forms of violations. And for these reasons, it is important. And we have to be contemporary with what's going on in, in, in that field. So with this um, background, we have the general recommendations that expand. Um, Article 10 is only up to H. But the general recommendation is uh, 10,500 words. So we have a greater expansion drawing on our practice, drawing on the recommendations that we even keep making to states. And so this is how the general recommendations come about. And here, let me again pay tribute to Professor Bailey. Uh, as I said, when I came onto the committee, uh, education was not that uh, well uh, dealt with. You saw the follow-up statistics. And she told me that when she came, there were times when even the concluding observations had nothing, not even, we're not even talking about the follow-up, had nothing. And uh, she brought education to the fore. I joined her, she was my mentor. She started general recommendation 36, she was a chair and I completed it. So this is the history of general recommendation 36. I think the Caribbean should also take your credit for it. Yes, and uh, this is why we, we craft the general recommendations. In some cases, those issues were not uh, in existence at all, for example, climate change. But in the case of education, it was there. But the way the uh, educational space has evolved, uh, the jurisprudence, the academic work was necessary to bring back into the committee in a way that everyone could access. And that is the general recommendation. That is and I think I gave the outline at the end. And we can see it is very comprehensive and covers uh, all sorts of issues, uh, including uh, the right to education and its justiceability, uh, the normative framework, which are the which which are the instruments that we uh, draw from, uh, addressing stereotyping, access, physical access, economic access, access, cyber bullying that was not there at the time. And so um, when the uh, recommendation was drafted. And so this is, uh, this is it. It gives us also an opportunity to restress the state's responsibility, which we have done in general recommendation uh, uh, 36. So ge general recommendation 36 is definitely one for us to pay some attention to and read through, particularly as we think about gender inequality in education and, and the direction that the Bahamas needs to go in. Um, quite recently, yes. we had some news stories about um, transgender students in schools mm -hmm. and sort of the, the, the responses or the reactions of mm -hmm. parents. And mm -hmm. just skimming through GR 36 and some references to gender identity, but also some references to, um, um, I think it's yes. called sex um, aggregated toilets. Um, yes. Is there anything there to speak to the specific needs of gender diverse students? Yes, there is. Um, I cannot put my finger on it right now, but there is the issue we have dealt with um, uh, lesbian, bisexual. LBTI uh, uh, students, girls, it, it, is, it is there. And I think it is very clearly articulated. Yes, 
it, it, it is there. Yes, exactly. So that that is a start because it's it start it's it it keeps coming up, as I said, and that was not the issue at the time that the convention was drafted. But we're seeing it: students claiming they're being discriminated against, they're not given the facilities, they're being bullied, and so on. And we have dealt with at least those aspects that I've talked about in the in the general recommendation thirty six. Absolutely. And while we are talking about resources, I think um, this is probably the first lecture after the publication of the updated commentary on CEDA. Uh, there was an initial commentary on CEDA, which talked about the rights uh, under the convention. And now it has been updated. Uh, Professor Billy and I have co-authored chapter 10 on education and it covers all the chapters. I think that this is a good opportunity also to look at the jurisprudence captured in there. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. So we, we will gather all of these links and we'll share them in the description of the recording that will be on YouTube. And we'll also update the Facebook event with these links as well for those who want to do some further reading. Thank you so, so much, Hillary, for doing this session with us. Your presentation was really comprehensive and, and dug really deep into some issues that I think some of us probably never thought of before, or definitely not in the context that you presented them. So this has been a really, really valuable session and one that I'll definitely go back and watch again so that I can take more notes and read through the, the general recommendation on education number 36 and the other document that you mentioned. Um, I see that Marion's on. You probably want to say some closing words, Marion? Certainly, I'll be happy to. And um, again, just to thank um, Hillary so much for being here with us all the way from Ghana. I love this new technology that allows us to, to do this so, so fairly easily, you know, and um, as long mm -hmm. as it works, we're, we're, we're all good to go. And so, Hillary, mm -hmm. I so appreciate your, your presence here, your incredible and wonderful and helpful elaboration of Article 10 in, 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 its, in its fullness and um, your responses to our questions. And I think this is just very helpful for us. This is a tremendous resource for Equality Bahamas, for, <clears throat> for the Bahamas in general, and for our region and um, anywhere else, because I think it's going uh, on, on the video, um, anybody can access it from anywhere in the world. And so Hillary, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you in another week in Geneva. Yes, we'll be together yes. and, um, at our next CEDAW session. And Lauren and Kadisha, who are um, members of, of Equality Bahamas, thank you so much for being right here with us in person. And to all our listeners um, who are on Facebook, etc. It's a, thank you so much. And thank you. Have a good Thank day. You. Have a good have a good evening. And Hillary, would you like to say something to, to close off? Just just a joy, uh, a delight to be here, and I have enjoyed the the, the enthusiasm with which the uh, presentation has been received. I've looked at the chats, and it is a pleasure. And I hope that we will have the opportunity to collaborate again. And um, just to gently tell Alicia that if you see me repeating uh, a program like this in Ghana, I am not stealing copyright or intellectual community. The highest form of admiration is imitation. And thank you so much. This has worked so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And I hope that you do take it up in, in Ghana and it should be taken up <laughs> everywhere, definitely. Uh, we will be announcing the dates for the next few sessions in the coming weeks. So we'll be looking at Article 11 next, which is on employment, followed by Article 12, which is on health. Really looking forward to those discussions. Definitely important. I'm sure everywhere, but particularly in the Bahamas, we have a couple of issues that we need to look into very, very soon. Um, follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Equality242, or you can just search Equality Bahamas. Thanks again to Lauren and Kadisha for being here. Thank you, Marion, for all of your help in getting these sessions organized. It's been really well received by everyone, and we wouldn't be able to do it without Marion's help, and definitely not without the experts that are coming from the CEDAW committee. So thank you, everyone, for being a part of this. Um, the next event that we have coming up is on Thursday, January 26th, so pretty soon, we have launched our Feminist Book Club, and those in NASA will be able to meet in person at Poinciana Paper Press, which is at number 12 Parkgate Road, 
Parkgate Road is the road between Camp Road and Village Road. Um, that will be at 6 p.m., but you can also join virtually. You can register at tiny.cc slash FBC 2023. The first book that we're reading is A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid. You still have time to read the book because it's only 79 pages. So <laughs> you can definitely read it in a couple of days and join the session Thursday, January 26 at 6 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. Register at tiny.cc slash FBC 2023. Thank you for joining and we hope to see you on Thursday.